Welcome to the Myth and Magic Authors Podcast, folklore and fantasy topics aimed at creative storytellers. To write stories and challenge your brain with exciting ideas, delve into these presentations and reflections. See how fantasy realms are based on actual world history, legend, and lore. Study fairy tales, nature fables, and supernaturalism to engage in a jumble of concepts that will trigger your fancy and get you writing imaginatively. Now, here's your host, Neil Mack. My guest on the Myth and Magic Fantasy Authors podcast is a bona fide film director. He says fantasy movies, horror movies and sci-fi movies, in fact genre movies, are at the forefront of giving us dreams we never had before. Yes, the Generation Z film director Ali Kamsa is a self-confessed movie buff, but not only that, he's also a fantasy and science fiction superfan with an immense subject matter knowledge and a wealth of experience in the motion picture industry. Ali is a busy podcaster and offers YASP, which is Y-A-S-P, a show which he co-hosts with his friend Ami Areza, and it's about social constructs. He established his email address in the year 1388, and that informed the name of his film production company, which is known as AK88. If you'd like to know how he set his email address up in year 1388, you'll have to listen to the interview. And so we chatted about the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. That's the Coen brother movie with actor, writer and director Tim Blake Nelson. And we discussed the idea of uh, what he called the scissor hand experience. We also discussed what makes a good movie character and how an author should write fantasy for cinema. This is an interview you won't want to miss, especially if your ambition is to one day see your story projected up there on the silver screen. Don't forget, by the way, if you want to chat with me about your upcoming project, whether it's a book or a painting or a film or poetry, then please tweet me at Neil Mac, N-E-I-L-M-A-C-H, or one word, and we can arrange an interview. But meanwhile, let's go over to Ali. Ali, yes. is it right to say Ali or Ali? It's Ali. Ali. You're a film director with a degree in cinema, so we'll talk about that exciting area in a moment. But first I wanted to chat to you about your podcasting because you're one half of the YASP podcast with uh, self-confessed nerd Ami Areza, and you are the host of the Last Thoughts of Busy Mind podcast where you recently asked, um, I noticed, what is the purpose of a ghost? And if listeners want to know what the answer to that is, they ought to sh check your show out. And you've tackled uh, topics like laziness and obsession and the social construct we call popularity. So would you be able to tell us a little bit about the drive and motivation behind those projects? Yeah, why you started out doing podcasting and were there any particular catalysts? Uh, well, honestly, uh... Yasp is another story that I'll get to in a minute, but <laughs> the last thoughts of a busy mind was basically I wanted to talk with people and yeah. I thought that what a, what's a better vehicle to talk with people rather than audio. It's literally me sitting in front of a microphone for 20 minutes and we actually wrapped up uh, season three, 45 chapters already and uh, sort of just I, I wanted to talk with people and the catalyst for finally doing it was the quarantine because I couldn't leave the house I, I felt really trapped and I thought well what better time than now to start all of these projects that I wanted to do for a while but couldn't yeah yes was sort of the same thing but the drive behind that was sort of Ami Reza as well my yeah. co-host because uh, we are both, well, self-proclaimed nerds, as <laughs> you put it, yeah. and uh, we talk about nerdy stuff all the time, and we basically just started recording it, and <laughs> uh, we are in our second season, by the way, and uh, it's sort of a fun 
just back and forth between two people. We, we are not even in the same city. He lives in another city. And this is sort of like we get to talk with yeah. each other like this. And the catalyst for that was also the quarantine. The quarantine made me do a lot of stuff that <laughs> I've had been planning for a while, yeah. but never got around to. Makes sense. And you're the man behind AK88 Studios. So I take yes. it AK stands for uh, uh, Ali Kamesh. Well, I'm guessing 88 is your origin. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a film director. Uh, yeah, with a degree yeah. in cinema. Yes. So that's going to be exciting for the listeners. Um, you suggested actually to me when we first started corresponding that you'd like to make a fantasy movie one day. So we'll talk about fantasy in a little while. But first, would you tell us what you've been doing with the AK88 Studios? Well, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry for correcting you about this. <laughs> uh, it's not uh, Kamesh, it's uh, Kamse, Kamse. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, no, it's it's... It's completely okay. Around half of the people in Iran miss with that too. <laughs> they call me Khamesh, which is a kind, yeah. of, kind of an inside joke here. And uh, the AK88 Studios was, is my YouTube channel, to be honest. And it was something that, again, I started doing, doing the quarantine and I stopped it to go and make my movie. I wanted to make a short movie which sadly was postponed due to a variety of reasons, including another surge of COVID yeah. uh, and my own personal scheduling sort of got mixed up in it too. But I'm trying to bring it back actually uh, in the August, I'm hoping to sort of revitalize it. But uh, the 88, by the way, in that is kind of a, idiotic story <laughs> uh, i don't know how familiar you are with persian calendar but persian calendar is different than the rest of the western world and uh, in arabic countries in middle east they have their own calendar called hijriya qamari which is basically i think when the prophet of islam was born i'm yeah. not sure on that but Iran has its own calendar, which is Hijri Shamsi, which is when the Prophet of Islam moved from one city to another. Yeah. And uh, so when I made my email address, it was uh, the year 1388, mm -hmm. and A, Kamsa was taken, so I just put the year behind that. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's where the 88 is coming from. And most people think I'm born in 1988, which I mean, I know I look older than my age, but I'm actually a Gen Z. I was born in 1997. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you love Westerns, yeah? Have you been involved in it, uh, producing any Western? And if not, would you have liked to have worked on a Western? Which one would you like to have worked on? Uh, well, um, Sadly, no, I haven't been involved in making a Western, but that is ma mainly a ge geographical limit Okay. because not a lot of Western movies are made in Iran, even though we have two deserts. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the nearest thing we got was a TV show called Once Upon a Time, Ruzi Ruzegari. That was the nearest thing to a Western, I think, was ever made in Iran. Mm. Uh, but that was way before I was born. So I wasn't involved in it. and But if I could be involved in a Western, I'm going to have to give two answers to that. Right. One is any, any Western ever, regardless <laughs> of my age, it would be Once Upon a Time in the West. Yeah, yeah say Julian is not Once Upon a Time in the West, even yeah. though uh, we'll get to it a bit later, another one of his movies. This one, I think, was the most fun to work with. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Henry Fonda and uh, Charles Bronson and Jason Robards, that just trio is so great. Yeah. And if considering my age, uh, I think the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, yeah. and more specifically, the segment of the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, that's the first one, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, Tim Blake Nelson's segment. Yeah. I think that is that just looks so much fun and i love a western that has kind of a cheeky tone to it yeah i mean i was thinking about um spaghetti westerns when i was 
thinking about writing this question because spaghetti westerns as you know were made by italians but in spain <laughs> so yes you know, there's, there's no uh, limit to the geography and then i was thinking really westerns are fantasy anyway we all know don't we um those john houston westerns really are talking about the 50s and 60s they're not actually talking about the 1880s yeah. we can think of the wild wild west as a western film but of course it was steampunk we can think of the okay, Deadlands yeah. RPG as an example of fantasy Wild West genre, or they sometimes call it the Weird West. And then I think there was yeah, the Dark yeah. Tower comic series, which uh, Stephen King was one of the contributors to. Don't you think that the reading literature public is hungry for something a bit different, some kind of uh, new slant on on West? I'm thinking really of you know, like a mixing fantasy with Wild West like um jonah hex's western goth style perhaps uh to be honest jonah hex i only saw the movie which right. i know is not the best <laughs> no. representation of the character but uh to be honest i had fun watching the movie yeah uh, and there, there is another kind of western-esque movie solomon kane i think was the name right. that also had that vibe to be honest i completely agree that uh Western fantasy is a thing, it's a sort of a mixture of genres that hasn't been developed very well and hasn't been explored very well, which I think is a shame because yeah. it's it's so ripe. Uh, I think, uh, and this is sort of a critique, I think, uh, it's very easy to make a Western sci-fi and there has been quite a number of them, yeah. like... Uh, the one that comes into my mind is uh, Cowboys and Aliens, John yeah. Favreau's Cowboys and Aliens. But when it comes to fantasy, I think uh, it's not as explored because, and this is something that I've been thinking about since uh, we talked about this. Mm. And I, I had a few thoughts about it and I hope I'm making sense. Uh, one of them I think is the image of well, uh, John Wayne and Clint Eastwood in Western is still so uh, prominent, even yeah. though we have, we've had so many good Westerns that deviate from that, that we think of Westerns as more grounded in reality than it actually is. Yeah. Like, no, none of those Western stories is real. Like, yeah. none of them. The myth of the lone cowboy is, well, a myth. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, John Ford made the myth so relatable and so grounded that it sort of becomes like reality. Yes. And I think it's one of the things that is plaguing uh, adding fantasy to Westerns. But when you think about it, I think Westerns are a great place for fantasies. You have your lone heroes. You have unexplored uh, territories in the yeah. West. You have mysticism of... Uh, cultures that were clashing together like the irish and the uh germanics people that would come to america and the native americans that were already there and it's such a wasted opportunity in my mm -hmm. opinion and uh i think it's something that if more people uh get into it i realize it's very hard to make it but if you get into it, I think it's a world of opportunities that mm. is just ready to be explored. Mm. Thanks for your thoughts on that. So what do you think is the best fantasy movie ever made? Uh, to be honest, I think <laughs> I'm going to disappoint a lot of people. Uh, it's Edward Scissorhands. Oh, lovely. Yeah, it is a good <laughs> movie. And uh, the reason I kind of love it. It's actually one of my top 10 movies ever made. I love this movie. Uh, I think part of it is stylistic and this is just my personal taste. I love Tim Burton's style. Yeah. Uh, his visuals and what he does with camera and music. I think it's great. Daniel Fan does a great job there. And the reason, but I think it's so great, and I will mention it a bit later too, is the relatability. I relate to this seemingly horrifying monster, which is actually not. 
uh, it's a postmodern movie. It's supposed to uh, reconstruct the monster myth, but uh, it's a movie that I feel close to in every aspect of it. And so I'm quite ready to accept any fantastical element they throw at me. Vincent Price making a man out of machine is completely understandable because I relate to this movie and these uh, characters. So I'm ready to accept the fantastical elements. Yeah. And it speaks to us on a human level. It doesn't really matter what your experiences of life are. There's certainly going to be a moment when you've met the uh, antagonist. You've also (laughs) had moments where you've been um, thought lesser of because just the way you are that moment or the way you look or whatever. Everybody's had experiences which we can relate to. Uh, you know, what I would call scissor hand. Precisely. Yeah. Scissor hand um, experiences, haven't we? I, I completely agree. Uh, and I think that that's what makes this movie, at least my favorite Tim Burton movie, one of the best fantasy movies ever, because it's really hard to see it and not find something that you can uh, relate to. Yeah. So what do you think makes a good fantasy story, which perhaps could be then converted into a uh, movie? I think for the most part, uh, again, hearkening back to the Edward Scissorhands, it needs to have sort of a human element to it. Even when it's a highly fantastical world. I usually use this example, but I know a lot of people have controversies over it, but Lord of the Rings is perhaps one of the most famous fantasy novels ever, and it has one of the most uh, detailed worlds ever created. Yeah. But still have that human element. You still need to have Frodo being persuaded by the ring. You still need to have some wise... Gamji uh, sort of uh, finding loyalty to his friend and uh, I'm sorry, royalty to his friend. Yeah. And you need to have Saruman fall from grace. You need to have those human elements so that we sort of find our internal links to them. Yeah. And then you build the fantasy around that. Like, okay, give me Saruman's fall from grace both literally and figuratively. Yeah. And uh, then I accept that there are trees that walk and talk. Yeah. Uh, as a film director, can you uh, advise anybody who's listening to this podcast how um, they should perhaps forge a fantasy in a way that would be useful to you as a director? Um, what advice would you give uh, anybody who's thinking about writing fantasy uh, and they want to see their book adapted for the big screen? I mean, if... If you're writing for the purpose of getting adapted to big screen, I think one of the things you need to realize is that you need to see the story as you're writing it. That's the important part. And that's, I think, what uh, Stephen King does. When you're reading his books, it's like you're literally reading the screenplay. He doesn't go that much into explaining like, the environment, because that's the set designer's job. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so you get the characters across, you get the plot across, and you write good dialogues for them. And that's enough for the purpose of just being adapted. Uh, that's very useful also because people spend a lot of time world building, but you don't need to build any description because all you're doing is concentrating what you're saying, which I think I, um, if I, if you don't mind, I sort of like put it into a nutshell. What you're saying is that you concentrate on the character and you concentrate on the plot. Is that right? Uh, yes. And when you do that, the rest sort of will come through. Uh, I think the world of A Song of Fire and Ice, uh, I hope I didn't miss remember that title, yes. uh, is so big, but you only get what you're needed. Like... Uh, which is the difference between Martin and Tolkien. Tolkien would give you all of the backstory. Martin will give you what you need and yeah. just that. I like that. That's excellent. Thank you for that. What is your favorite movie characters? What do you think then are the essential ingredients of a good movie character? 
Well, if I have to choose top three movie characters, I would say it's Hannibal Lecter. Uh-huh. It's Scar from Lion King. And it's Don Vito Corleone. Uh-huh. And I know all three are adapted, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think what gives at least for me makes these characters interesting is first of all uh, they have how, how do i say it confidence in what they are doing like uh, don corleone never stops to think am i the bad guy are we the baddies that old uh, mark and web sketch like are we the baddies uh, scar never does that or hannibal Lecter. they are content with what they are doing but they are also ready to accept their failures. Like I, I say one of the best moments in Godfather part one, and this is a bit of a spoiler for anyone who hasn't <laughs> seen it, is when Don Corleone sees Michael in the hospital and starts crying because he realizes all of his dreams is uh, destroyed at this point. Michael will never become a senator. He will never become the president. He's going to be the Godfather. Yeah. And um, he, that moment is when you realize Don Corleone, the magnitude of this character that is all throughout the movie, even though he's in the movie for like 20 minutes, it's a three hour movie, he's in it for 20 minutes of it, but he feels like he's always there. But that magnitude of character has shortcomings and he cries when he finds those shortcomings. And that balance is so good. Uh, Again, Hannibal Lecter, and even though I don't like the movie Hannibal by Ridley Scott, yeah. I don't think it was a good movie, but it has a great scene. Again, kind of a spoiler. Hannibal uh, is handcuffed to Clarice. Hannibal cuts his own hand off, not Clarice's hand. And that is the moment that you realize this mysterious psychologist who eats people may have had some sort of a feeling for this girl. And lost basically but he was ready to accept that uh, not as much can be said for scar but it's yeah. because disney literally killed him before he could have his resolution <laughs> yeah yeah i don't think there's anything particularly nice about scar but <laughs> there must be but some well, i suppose it's the, uh, the the contrast between the two brothers maybe that's what it is yes brother. So and of course, to be honest, I'm sorry, I need to mention this. Uh, Jeremy Irons does one of the best <laughs> voice acting jobs in the history of cinema for that movie. Have you noticed that all baddies are English speaking? I could be a, a good baddie, I think. <laughs> I I think, yes, to be honest, I actually, uh, again, I'm sorry for tooting my own horn. <laughs> one of the first uh, papers I wrote for my uh, university was about villains and i think it's basically because most uh, people associate the british accent with high class and uh, aristocracy and yeah. well aristocracy is usually not the good side <laughs> no <laughs> so we talked about um when we were talking about wild west and you mentioned that um Sky-fi films or sci-fi films often have a Western theme to them. I was thinking actually of Serenity while you were talking about while you were talking about that. Oh. Yeah. But um, yeah. what about uh, Star Wars? Is that a sci-fi picture or is it a fantasy? I mean, I, gone to my head, it's a fantasy. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's a fantasy that has an outer coating of sci-fi. Yeah. Uh, which, I mean, it's not a bad thing, but to be honest, when I think of a sci-fi movie, I think uh, Star Trek, not Star Wars. Yes. Because maybe it's just because the techno bubble, but that techno bubble is very important in Star Trek because it needs to, sci-fi needs to have a level of believability. Yeah. Uh, like groundedness and nothing about the world of Star Wars is grounded. It's basically a fantasy movie with magic and uh, samurais, but set in space. It is. Uh, if you were, so, so they brought you in, they said, like, Ali, could you come in and um, redirect <laughs> Star Wars? How would you improve it? 
I mean, the franchise as a whole, I would cut off the Skywalker family immediately. <laughs> so it's enough. <laughs> We've had enough. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I think the best Star Wars movies are the ones that expand on those same uh, fantastical elements. Uh, I love Empire Strikes Back. And I, I know this is controversial, but my second favorite Star Wars movie is The Last Jedi. Yeah. And, and I know Last Jedi is flawed, by the way. I know it has problems, big problems, but I think what they did with it was kind of interesting. Like, I, I don't like stories like uh, Solo or Rogue One or, well, Rise of Skywalker or Return of the Jedi that tend to sort of just try to fill in gaps that nobody has to be filled. Yeah. You know, the world of Star Wars is limited, which is a problem, but it's also expansive. So uh, the good ones are the ones that take some new element and develop that. Like Empire Strikes Back talks about uh, the relationship between hate and force and the dark side of the force. Yeah. And The Last Jedi talks about the importance of uh, hereditary uh, connections like what would you do if you were really a nobody until jj abrams came and completely ruined that yeah. but before that it was a very interesting idea yeah so it's like a knight as you said samurai it's a knightly idea it's really it's a medieval knights but brought up to date yes uh, the reason i mentioned the samurai thing by the way is a uh, kind of a uh, thing because george lucas sort of modeled the original Star Wars after the Akira Kurosawa movie, High yeah. Fortress. Yeah. And so sort of, I always thought of them as samurai. Yeah. I suppose I should ask you really who your favorite directors are. Give me your oh, top three. Uh, I mean, uh, Sergio Leone is number one for me. <sighs> I adore the man. He made six movies, seven actually, but the first one we don't talk about. But he made six movies, and all six of them are masterpieces, I think. Yeah. And after that, it's Tim Burton, because I find a sort of a kinship to him. I think uh, I see a lot of myself in him. Nice. Uh, and the third one is Terry Gilliam. Oh, but, right, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he's um, the most uh, British American ever. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So he's the and, fifth element, isn't he? Uh, no, no, he didn't oh. make uh, the fifth element. Uh, fifth element was Luc Besson. Luc Besson, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, he made Brazil, which is a great movie. He made A Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Of course. Uh, he made uh, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. Uh, mm. Fairly recently, his latest movie was The Man Who Killed Don Quixote. Uh, which had one of the best performances of Don Quixote, Jonathan Price portraying the Mad Knight, which is yeah. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think the reason I love Terry Gilliam is sort of like um, if Burton speaks to me on an emotional level, Gilliam speaks to me on an intellectual level. Like I understand what he's saying and I agree with a lot of what he's saying. Yeah. That's excellent. Thank you. So um, have we covered everything that you would like to talk about in regards with movies? Because if we have, we can just ask you about what you're doing next with your projects. Oh, uh, well, just one final thing I wanted to mention because I don't have anywhere else to put it. It's no, uh, again about a fantasy movie. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things that make fantasy movies great in cinema is the fact that as cinema progressed, fantasy movies and sci-fi movies and horror movies, these genre movies, were at the forefront of giving us dreams that we never had before. Yeah. Like if we look at the movies that pushed cinema one step closer, is basically either a horror movie, whether it's Nosferatu or it's a sci-fi movie like Metropolis, yeah. or it's a fantasy movie, like again, not for what, <laughs> yeah. but at the same time, uh, the Lord of the Rings, I think, did so much for the world of cinema as a whole, and it was all made because 
they needed to make it. And I think that's why fantasy movies tend to be at the forefront of technological advancement in cinema and story advancement in cinema. Ah. Like they, they are always there. And next to them are sci-fi and horror. Basically the genre movies that were seen as, for lack of a better term, kids stuff are what actually gives us the best moments we remember. Again, E.T., I think, is a great example of that. Yeah. It's literally a kid's movie, but, I mean, it's great at what it's doing. Yeah. That's an excellent answer. Thank you for that. So what are you doing next? What's, um, what next uh, projects have you got lined up for yourself? Well, as I mentioned, uh, I'm trying to revitalize my YouTube channel, AK88 Studios. Yeah. And uh, I'm doing it with a big project about Neil Gaiman's American Gods, talking about fantasies. Perfect. Uh, it's uh, about the show, though, not the book. <laughs> yeah, I like the show. It's about I like the, both. I like yeah, the book, they, and then I like the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's about that, and it will probably come out in August. Uh, I do have quite a bit of scheduling conflicts and a lot of tests I, uh, that I need to take. Yep. But after that, I will probably go back to making my movie and just, I, it's been so long, but I really want to make that. And it does have a fantastical element to it. So I'm sort of building my own fantasy movie at this point. Okay, that's good. Is that got a specific name? Uh, the movie has a working title at the moment. It's called Sand, but uh, I hope to find a better name for it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good idea. And if anybody wants to follow uh, your projects, where's the best place for them to go? If you want to know what I'm doing, I usually post st stuff I'm doing on my Instagram page. I used to have a Twitter, but I don't go there anymore. Yep. It's uh, my Instagram page. But if you want to follow a project specifically, I suggest Yasp because I think it's easier for people to get into yep. than my other stuff. Okay. And I usually also advertise whatever I'm doing on that show too. <laughs> and how do we get hold of Yes? Uh, I mean, you can follow it on any podcast platform of your choice. It's Y A S P exclamation point yep. podcast. And uh, our latest episode, I don't know when this episode is going to come out, but our latest episode on July 30th is yep. going to be about the show Over the Garden Wall. Oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, so uh, you can follow that, and uh, I hope I hope you find it as good as we feel like when we're making it. <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, Ali. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, just thank you for having me. Thank you so much. That's all right. Um, keep in contact and um, good luck with everything you're doing. And it's fantastic to hear from you. And it's very exciting, actually. I thought I've never spoken to a film director before. I, I imagine that a lot of listeners have never heard of a film director talking about fantasy titles before. And uh, maybe you could come back another thank time, you. maybe in a year's time, and we could catch up and get up to date with all the latest fantasy uh, news and all of that nerd stuff. Well, yeah? <laughs> yes, I, I hope so. If, you, if you'll have me back, oh, definitely. I'll, definitely, I'll definitely join you. Thank you so much for this.